She sent me the last text that she sent me when the police knocked on her door. And they heard the gunshot 30 minutes later. So I came over here in September of 2015 and all three of my kids had grown. Uh, the two oldest had graduated from college. The youngest one was taking a little break from college but she had already finished two years. Had just moved into an apartment on her own. Um, my ex-husband was moving to, you know, PCSing. And so I came over here and I was just really excited. And I was over here for about a month and not quite a month and I got a text from my daughter actually so she was 20 and and I could just tell by the text all she said was mom but I just knew something wasn't right and that was that was October the 14th 2015 it's just a day I'm not ever gonna forget and I went to work um, kept trying to text her and call her she didn't answer but I wasn't really worried because she she kind of struggled with depression off and on through high school. She cut, she was a cutter. Um, and I just felt like that she was always gonna be okay. That's just that's just what happens is is you go through a tough time and then and then you're okay at the end of it. And so that's what I was expecting. It it took me a while. I did finally manage to get a hold of her that evening because I had her apartment manager go and, you know, knock on her door. She texted that night and we talked a lot and she actually told me that she didn't want to live anymore, that she was really tired and that she just didn't feel very strong. Honestly, you know, as Department of Army civilians and military as well, we do ACE training every year, right? It's a mandatory training that we have to do and I've done it every year and know what it means, ask care escort. And obviously she didn't make me ask her. She told me that she was tired and that she didn't want to live. She, I care just like we do with our kids. I would have give, I would give my life for any of my kids. And escort was a little difficult because I was in Germany and she was in the States. And so I told her that I was going to call someone and she got mad at me and she told me that she really she just needed me to listen and she didn't want me to call anyone. She just wanted me to listen. And she said, this is why I don't want to talk to you about this stuff because you overreact. So I had a few thoughts in that moment of, okay, she just said I'm overreacting. So maybe she doesn't really mean it. She probably doesn't mean it. We've been down this road before and this, this isn't going to happen to me, right? This isn't, this isn't my life. I've raised three strong kids. We had a great, we did have a great family growing up or the kids growing up and I just felt like that everything was gonna be okay. We talked, I had her best friend come over. Her best friend got there. We texted off and on all night long. She went over to some other friend's house and took them food and they were playing a game. On Thursday, the next day, she, she did great again. Um, Friday, she was better. Saturday, she told me that she was gonna go meet her dad and her brothers for lunch, which was a little bit of drive. They were all kind of driving to meet somewhere in the middle. And then Zachary, her brother, our middle one, was going to come and stay with her and bring the dog. And I was, I was super excited, because I'm like, okay, this is good, she's good. She, everything's gonna be fine. And I wanted to talk to her about going back to get some counseling, but I wanted to wait until our son was there. I didn't want to approach it, especially since I believe she was doing better. I didn't want to approach it before I knew that someone was with her. And that day I went to Nuremberg with a friend. I had only been over here, like I said, about a month. I was still kind of exploring and in the mindset of, you know, who am I gonna to get to be and I wanna see Europe. And I went to Nuremberg. She and I texted off and on all day long. I kept telling her to have a safe trip. She never said anything different, that she wasn't driving. I told her that I wanted her to, you know, I was excited about her having Izzy, the dog. She never said anything to the contrary, that anything was going to be different than, than that. And actually the day before we had talked a lot about her birthday, which was the next week and the things she wanted for her apartment. And you know me, I love Amazon Prime. You can, <laughs> you can buy anything on Amazon and have it delivered. So I was getting these things already delivered. I was probably ordering them while we were talking. 
And so that Sunday, she just didn't really say a lot. I mean, she, she didn't correct me when I told her to have a safe drive. She told me that she was tired, but that she was looking forward to having Izzy, and which is the dog. And I went to bed that night and I texted her good night, just like I always did. And she texted me back good night and that she loved me. And so then the next morning, I woke up about 5.30, right before my alarm would have gone off because I heard my phone ringing. And I thought it was odd to be someone calling me that early in the morning, but you know, I just, I still had my US number. So, you know, salespeople were still calling. I just kind of looked at it and I didn't recognize the number and I just deleted it. Just, I didn't answer it. And about the same time I realized that, and I saw that I had a text from Alyssa from about an hour prior to that. And she just told me that she loved me and that she um, was appreciated me. And then she immediately had another text after that that said, I, you know, I'm fine, don't worry, I'm good and that she loved me again. And, and, and about the same time that a text popped up and it was a number, it was the number that just called me, but I didn't have a name to go with it. And it, she told me that she was who she was and it was Alyssa's boss's wife and that she had gotten a really disturbing text from Alyssa, so had her best friend. And they were at Alyssa's apartment and the police were there. So I immediately called and I was, cons I, at this point now, I was, I was getting concerned. I didn't understand what the text would have been because my text that I got from her was sweet and loving. And so I called and they just said that she just, her name is Ashley. She just said that the, the text was disturbing, but she didn't say what it was. And she put me on the, she asked me about Alyssa and I said, no, I think she's with Zachary. Um, you know, let me call. So I called Zachary and he answered the phone and I asked him where he was and was he with Alyssa? And he said, no, that Alyssa had first texted all of them and canceled lunch. And then she had just separately texted Zachary when he was on his way to her house to not come and to wait a, a couple days. And so he was staying with our oldest son, Marcus. And I, I don't really know how to explain, like in that moment, what I felt because, because I knew, I, I knew then. I knew that the day, the things that she had said on the 14th were real. I knew that she had probably been lying very effectively. And I, I just felt pretty sick. And so I called her dad and told him, you know, hey, I, I, something's wrong and Zachary's not with Alyssa. And he said, well, yeah, he is. You know, he was going there. And I said, no, this is what happened. And, you know, in retrospect now, she knew exactly what she needed to do. She would tell, she told each of us certain things, knowing who we were and who we weren't going to talk to. And I called back Ashley and she put me on the phone with the police. And the police asked me if I was alone and I told them that I was. And they told me that they wanted me to call somebody. And so I did, I called the person that I had gone to Nuremberg with the day before who I really had just met in the last month. And I also called another friend of mine who I knew from our previous duty station and who knew Alyssa as well. And they both came over pretty, pretty immediately. And, you know, the police asked me a lot of questions and I didn't, I answered them. I was, I mean, I was confused and I was scared and I knew, I knew what the outcome was going to be. But as a mom, you don't, you don't know how to wrap your head around what that is going to look like other than just, I, I knew that it was not going to go well. And the, the, late, the people that I was with also called my boss. So it wasn't very long. I had three people in my room. And I continued to communicate with a couple of people from home that were at Alyssa's apartment. And I knew that the, that the, the ambulance had come and gone. And I knew that the, core, the, um, the police department, the SWAT team came and they left and there was never any report of where Alyssa was. 
And I continued to talk to her dad. He, he was just sure that they were, that Alyssa was out somewhere partying. And man, do I wish that that was the outcome of what that night ended up being. But it took about five hours. Um, after about two hours, the people that I had been talking to stopped texting back. They stopped answering my phone calls. And so it took a total of five hours. So the first phone call I got was about 5.30 in the morning. And the next phone call that I got was at about 10.30. Sorry. And it was her dad. Um, and he got the notification and said that, that you know, that everything was going to be okay and that he was going to take care of everything. And, of course, we both knew that was a lie because everything was not going to ever be okay again. I think that my scream was so loud that the people in the temporary lodging came to check on me because they didn't know what was going on, of course. My friends were there, um, and I, I don't really remember much of the rest of that day except going out and standing on the, the uh, balcony. And of course, it was October, and it was cool. And I remember standing on the balcony and I was holding my cell phone in my hand and I wanted to jump. And because I just didn't know what else I was supposed to do with everything that had just happened. I was overseas um, and really, honestly, your worst nightmare as a parent had just become my reality. And I, I wasn't even sure what I was supposed to do, but I knew that I didn't want to live. <laughs> And I remember looking over the edge and, and my friends were inside and I'm sure they were keeping a close eye on me. And I just remember looking down and thinking, I just don't think this is high enough. I think that if I jump from here, I'm gonna live, probably have some broken bones and so that I'm gonna be in physical pain as well as feeling like my heart is in a million pieces. So Tanya, my friend that I had known for a long time um, and that knew Alyssa, I, she took me to do things. I, I, I don't even remember, and I, and I think that it's so interesting to, to talk about it now because I remember how I felt. I remember the, the sounds of that day. I remember her trying to get me to eat something, but I don't remember what we did. We did things. I think we went and got a power of attorney in case I didn't get to come back. I. I don't, I don't know. I had friends that brought me food and drink. I remember asking for ice because that's hard to come by over here. <laughs> and I remember they brought me a pretzel. I remember trying to eat. I remember trying to sleep. Um, Tanya's husband came over and I remember him trying to get me to pack. And I remember thinking, how do you pick out clothes to go back for a funeral? And how am I ever gonna be able to wear these clothes again, whatever I pick out? And I remember thinking, my life is never gonna be the same, and my life is never gonna be okay. And I got to St. Louis, and my Danny Ellis's dad and my boys met me at the gate. And then we drove the two and a half hours to get home to my family, to my mom and my sisters. And it's just, there's nothing that can prepare anyone for that. And we spent the next several days planning her funeral and picking out clothes and listening to a million songs that I can no longer hear without crying in stores that I won't ever be able to walk into again. And I remember talking to the pastor that was going to do the funeral service and one of the first things that he asked us is, was it okay for him to share what happened? And Alyssa's dad and I had already talked about it and I knew I wasn't going to be able to be silent because as hard as it is to talk about 
and as devastating as it is, I just thought back to all of the times that I sat in the back of the auditorium being so aggravated that I was having to do suicide awareness and suicide prevention training. I got so tired of hearing about ACE. I got tired of being asked to carry around a card. And I would have never, ever, ever in a million years thought that that's where I was going to end up. And so I knew that from the beginning, that at least for me, I was not going to be able to be silent. I was going to have to be able to show people that suicide can affect anybody. We had, an, we had a great loving family. I still get along really well with Alyssa's dad. We, I talk to my boys on a regular basis. I talk to Alyssa every single day. She was depressed. She didn't feel like she knew what to do to, to handle that. And in the end, she ended up not wanting to ask for help. And there was a million people that would have given her anything to, to help her and she didn't want to. So what it did for me is make me know that I couldn't be silent. So actually in her service, he talked about suicide and I will forever, I will forever speak about it. And I won't be ashamed, and I'm not ashamed. Alyssa was incredible, she is incredible. She was the most sarcastic, sweet, loving person. She was funny. Um, she could play the guitar like nobody's business. She could sing. She was smart. She had awesome friends. I mean, there was, you know, when you just look at it from the outside, it looks like she had everything going for her. And, and in the end, depression won. So I think this all started with you asking the question of, you know, what has happened to make me be strong? That happened. And, and what it did is it caused my own battle with depression. It caused me to hold a bunch of pills in my hand and want to take my own life. Before I remembered what it felt like to stand at the back of a funeral home and what it feels like to be on the other end of that. And so I speak because I don't want anyone else to have to sit here like I do. That's not the reality, unfortunately. But I think that by speaking and by talking about Alyssa and by not being afraid to say that I struggle, I, I hope that what it does is it puts a face with what this is. Suicide doesn't just impact other people. It doesn't just impact the people that you can tell are depressed. It impacts all of us. And I think that I hope I believe that by speaking out, people can see that it, that it really does, that it impacts, it impacts everybody, just maybe not in the ways that you think. And I speak out, I let people know if they say something that bothers me. I let them know if they, you know, that silly gun to your head, if you've gotten frustrated at your computer, well, that, that upsets me. And I let them know, and I don't think that it's a, it's a, I try not to do it in a way that's, that make people feel bad, but I just try to do it in a way that you just don't know who's sitting next to you. You don't know who's struggling with depression. You don't know who's maybe having suicidal thoughts. And I think we just need to be really cognizant of what we do. And, and, I, and this time, this year, when I'm speaking, I end kind of with, I have a goal. I think we need to put C on the front of ACE as well. I think we need to start showing people that we care on the front end. And if we do that just in really small ways, then I think that it makes it can make a difference. And, and I start out, I say, the people that show me that they care on a regular basis in small ways, just by popping in my office and hey, saying, hey, hope you're having a good day, leaving little notes on my monitor when they know I'm having a bad day by letting me know that I matter, those people then shouldn't 
ever have to ask me. And we don't have to get to A, which is the goal, right? To, to, we want to ask, but, but obviously the goal would be to not ever feel like we need to ask because the people know that we care about them and that we're genu genuinely concerned. I would tell them I know how they feel. I would tell them that I think it took me getting that low to really understand why Alyssa made the decision that she did. I've not been angry with her. I've not felt she was selfish. I've been sad. I have moments of being angry, but she was, she is my baby and I love her and I'm gonna protect her. I think what I would tell somebody is I know what it feels like and I know that asking for help can seem harder than picking up the pills or making the decision. Asking for help for me was harder. It really was. That night was a struggle. It would have been easier in that moment to take those pills because I didn't know how I was supposed to live with the pain that I felt. I would tell them that there is somebody that cares. You think that there isn't, but there is. Depression convinces you that nobody cares and nobody has time for you, but, but it's a lie. However, I also know that when you're there, you don't believe that. And, and so, you know, I'm not a therapist by any means. I'm not a, I'm not a provider. I'm not a professional, but I care. I care about everyone. And I know that everyone has at least one person and probably a lot more than that, that would talk to them all night long, just like people have talked to me, that would stop everything they're doing to come and take them for help, that would, that, that would be devastated if they made that decision. I think that you have to show them that you truly care. So I think, I think that we've gotten so used to just it being this thing that we do and it makes us uncomfortable, right? It, it, makes, it makes people uncomfortable if I tell them that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of ready to die. Um, but I think we have to get to where you can really just genuinely sit down with them and have a conversation. It doesn't necessarily need to start out with, you know, hey, are you thinking about dying? But, but show them that you care. And I think that when they see that you care, they're going to open up to you. And then the other thing that I would say is once you have determined that they are for sure, um, or even that they're even remotely thinking about it, don't leave them alone. Don't leave them alone. They might get mad. Let them get mad. Um, I, I have somebody that sent me a text after I lost Alyssa. And the text basically just said, you know, I'm sorry, I failed. Check the obituaries and I love you. And I was devastated and I went into panic mode and I, I called a friend that lived close to where this person lives and I had them call the police and he was livid with me. He cussed me out for quite a minute. Um, I didn't care, because he was still alive. And if I could go back, I would have made Alyssa mad. So when she told me that she didn't want me to call anyone and she got mad, I, I would make her mad. And so I think that what I tell people all the time is, if you really suspect that, if you do, or even if you only kind of suspect it, do something, do something. It might make them mad, but I can promise you that them being mad is better than you having to sit on this side of this camera.